Romans 1, 24 to 127 is, of course, a key text in which Paul addresses the issue of homosexual practice. The larger context in Romans 1, 18 to 320, Paul is making the argument not merely that all are under sin, not just the Gentiles, but also Jews, but all are culpable for the sin that they commit because they sin suppressing the truth about God and about themselves accessible to them in the material structures of creation. They are, in effect, without excuse. This is the point he makes in Romans 1.18 to 1.32. He's largely addressing the issue of Gentiles, persons who don't have the direct revelation of Scripture in front of them. And he starts off with two particular vices, which he believes makes his point that they are culpable for the sin that they commit, even in the absence of direct revelation, because they have the indirect revelation of nature. Romans 1, 18 to 32 is an extended vice list. A vice or offender list, a list that we find in Paul, where Paul talks about certain kinds of offenders or offenses that will exclude people from the kingdom of God. And when we see these a vice or offender list, whether it's Galatians, Romans, the Corinthian correspondences, or elsewhere, we see that Paul always leads off with idolatry and sexual immorality in either order. Sometimes he starts with sexual immorality, follows up with idolatry, then a series of social offenses, social or economic exploitation, or things of that sort. Or he may start with idolatry, the more usual order, and then follow with sexual immorality. That's what we have going on in Romans 1. He starts off with the issue of idolatry. His argument is that from the world around us, the grandeur of the created order, uh, the vastness of it, uh, we should deduce that God cannot be restricted or limited in worship to a statue made in the image of humans or worse, animals. So that a human that engages in idolatry, whether this involves the creation of statues or whether this involves something like a more modern form of idolatry, which is simply creating God in our own individual image, rather than being reshaped in God's image. Either way, we ought to know better. God is greater than we are, greater than anything in the created order. There has to be an artisan or a fashioner of the created order that stands above it. And to limit that God to something that God created, something that we can manipulate and use for our own purposes, is a clear evidence of suppressing the truth about God accessible to us in nature, in creation. In fact, Paul makes this point in Romans 1, 19 to 20, that the knowable aspect about God is obvious to us. It's transparent to us. It's clear. And we have to deliberately suppress that truth in order to not acknowledge it. So we know better, and yet we still engage in sin. Then he moves into the next set of offenses we would expect him to mention in a vice or offender list. That is sexual immorality. And what Paul wants to do is pinpoint a particular form of sexual immorality that will make his point that people actually suppress the truth about God accessible to them in the material structures of creation. It's hardly surprising that he would select among sexual offenses the one in the ancient world most characterized as being contrary to nature. And the argument that's typically made uh, in the Greek and Roman milieu out of which Paul operates by some Greek moralists and some Greek or Roman physicians is that it's obvious that man and woman are designed for sexual coupling. Anatomically and physiologically, it's clear. These are actually the kinds of arguments that are made in the ancient world. Look at the anatomy of male and female. Look at the fact that only male and female can procreate. Even psychologically speaking, look at the two of them. And it's obvious that the only two sexual comp complements or counterparts that exist are a man and a woman, a male and female. So that when a male has sex with another man, a male with a male, or a female with a female, it's an obvious indicator of suppressing the truth about the way in which we have been made. It's not intended to be rocket science or brain surgery, to be a little bit anachronistic here. It's intended to be obvious. So we have a nature argument that Paul fashions here, which is kind of an absolute argument. 
It's not an argument that you can say, oh, well, Paul doesn't mean to apply that to committed homosexual unions. No, the point of the argument is any act between two, two males or two females is inherently an act against nature because it's an act that violates the way in which our bodies have been made. They've been made not to be independent, uh, but rather to be only half of a larger sexual spectrum. This is obvious in the sexual coupling, that it takes a male and female, they fit, the parts fit with one another, and they also work together with one another in terms of procreation. These are clear indicators, clues in the way that we have made about God's intent for sexual design. There is a design, in other words, in the way that we're made sexually. Paul also at the same time here is not only alluding to indirect revelation of nature, but also the direct revelation of scripture. If we looked at Romans 1.23 and we look at Romans 1.24 to 1.27, we see a series of allusions to Genesis 1.26 to 1.27. In fact, there are eight points of correspondence in a three-part structure between these two sets of texts. God creating human beings in his image and likeness. Those three points, human image and likeness. To have dominion over birds, cattle, reptiles those three elements of the animal creation, and then God creating us male and female. Those eight points of correspondence, human image likeness, bird, cattle, reptiles, male and female. Those eight points of correspondence are made in Genesis 1, to 127, and the allusion to them in Romans 1, and 1, to 127. It's what scholars would call an intertextual echo. You don't have to actually cite an Old Testament text. You can create a, so many allusions between a short set of texts, one from the New Testament into the Old Testament, that it's obvious to readers in the first century who have some knowledge of Old Testament that, that he's making an allusion to these texts. And in alluding to Genesis 1:27, male and female, he made them. Paul is saying, look, uh, God's will which is made clear in the direct revelation of scripture is embedded in the natural structures of creation. So if you're not a Jew and you're only a Gentile, you can only need to look at the way men and women are made to know what God's will is for human sexual pairing. If you're a Jew, you're doubly held accountable for acts of same-sex intercourse because you not only have the revelation indirectly in nature, but also the direct revelation of Genesis 1 and 2. In addition to those two arguments, a series of others we can make. Some say, well, Paul's not talking about consensual relationships, and yet Paul talks about males being inflamed with males. He expresses the mutuality and reciprocity of their affections for one another. He's not talking about, for example, masters coercing slaves or adolescents into this act. He's talking about consensual acts that involve mutual uh, sexual stimulation on the part of the parties involved, two men, two women. He also refers to lesbianism, females having sex with females. Uh, why is that important? Because lesbianism in the ancient world is not known for being particularly exploitative. It's not conducted typically with uh, adolescent females. It's not conducted typically with slaves or with call girls so that when lesbianism is indicted, it's a way of indicting same-sex intercourse, even among consensual committed relationships between adults. Sometimes the argument is made that they didn't know about committed same-sex relationships in the ancient world. If you hear somebody making that argument, you can know right away that they don't know the ancient evidence because we have plenty of examples in the ancient world, in the Greek and Roman world, not only of a conception, the ability to conceive of carrying relationships between um, same-sex persons who are adults in a consensual union, but uh, we also have actual examples of that taking place. In fact, the rabbis uh, in later on in the uh, early part, second, third, fourth century, actually forbid marriages between men and between women. We have church fathers operating in the period from the second to fourth centuries who likewise are aware of marriages, semi-official marriages going on between men and between women in the ancient world and still call these contrary to nature. Uh, we have plenty of uh, 
uh, Greek philosophers um, who refer to, we actually have debates in the ancient world between proponents of man-male love and proponents of male-female love, where those promoting man-male love will argue that the kinds of relationships we're talking about are committed loving relationships between equal age pairings of men. We're not talking about exploitative relationships. And those who are debating with them, who are trying to make the case for superiority of heterosexual bonds, actually come out and state, we can see the point that homosexual relationships can be caring, but they're still contrary to nature based on the way man and woman are made. So they knew about committed relationships in the ancient world between persons of the same sex, even semi-official marriages going on. We know about them in Alexandria, Egypt. We know about them going on in Rome. And yet, we even know of some Greek and Roman moralists and physicians who concede the existence of such unions and yet still call them unnatural. What is the likelihood that Paul, operating out of a milieu that is much more strongly opposed to homosexual practice, ancient Israel, early Judaism, than anything we find going on in the ancient Near East or in the Greco-Roman Mediterranean basin? What is the likelihood that Paul coming out of that culture would have been had some sort of secret acceptance for caring, committed homosexual unions when in fact we know even some Greek and Roman moralists, pagans, who reject that view, um, who, re who believe that those unions are unnatural even when they're committed and loving. There's no likelihood of Paul accepting committed unions given that historical context, given what the church fathers argue, given what later rabbis argue. There are all sorts of theories that posit some biological influence on homosexual development in the ancient world. This is not an entirely piece of new knowledge for us uh, in our modern context. In fact, we have a scholar, Lewis Crompton, self-identified gay man, gay historian, wrote a 500-page book called Homosexuality and Civilization. Uh, Crompton, as you might imagine, as a gay man, is thoroughly supportive of homosexual unions. But when it comes time to talking about scripture, Crompton simply says, some people who are very well-meaning argue that Paul didn't know anything about committed homosexual unions entered into by persons who are sexually oriented to the same sex. And had he known about it, it would have changed his view. Crompton says, however well-meaning these views are, they're completely unhistorical. The ancient evidence indicates to us that there is no kind of homosexual union, whether committed and consensual or entered into by homosexually oriented persons that would have made any difference to a Jewish and Christian indictment of this practice. Romans 1, 18 and 32, in the text three times refers to God handing or giving people over to carry out the dishonoring or degrading desires that they want to participate in. It's expressed in the text as a manifestation of God's wrath or judgment on them. In other words, it's sort of a passive aggressive mode on God's part, where God steps back and allows people to be controlled, enslaved by the very desires that they want to engage in. Even though those desires dishonor uh, the person that, that God has created in his own image. It can be a redemptive element to that picture too, we can perhaps posit, which is namely that as they see the controlling and degrading influences of being handed over to these impulses, that they might come to their senses and turn away from it. But the other prospect is also possible that they continue to heap up their sins. And in that context, it leads to a cataclysmic judgment at the end. So in part, if we look at wrath as God's, in the first stage of God's wrath as God stepping back and allowing people to be controlled by desires that lead to their death, then God's grace must be the opposite of that. God's grace is actively stepping into the picture to prevent people from being enslaved by these innate desires that they have to do what God forbids. Romans 1, 18 and 32 is not about how these desires originate. Paul talks about that when he gets to Romans 5 and he talks about sin coming out of Adam. Romans 1 rather talks about the decline of civilization. It's talking about human beings being handed over to their pre-existing desires. Far from suggesting that, uh, Romans 1 suggesting that Paul's only talking about constitutional heterosexuals 
who then in a sort of artificial way try to act homosexual. On the contrary, the text is talking about persons enslaved by pre-existing desires to do what God doesn't want them to do. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, Paul has a vice list, another offender list, in which he says to the Corinthians to stop deceiving themselves. The following groups of people will not inherit the kingdom of God. He starts the list off with a group called the pornoi, the sexually immoral. He starts with those because he's still dealing in context with a consensual sexual offense involving two persons who are too much alike in their embodied structures, here on the level of kinship. A man having sex with a stepmother, which in effect functions as a sub legal substitute for one's own mother. And in that, he calls that person, the man who is having that kind of sex, a sexually immoral person, a pornos. So he leads off the vice list in 1 Corinthians 6 with the pornoi, sexually immoral people. He then mentions idolaters, and then he fills out further what he means by sexually immoral people. Not only the incestuous man he just talked about in the preceding chapter, but also other sexual offenses, adulterers, and he talks about the malakoi, which is a Greek term that literally means the soft men. But in the context of listing sexual offenses, because we know we have other examples of this in the ancient world, both in Latin and Greek texts, it refers to men who actively feminize themselves to attract male sex partners. They're typically viewed as the passive, receptive partners in homosexual male practice. And then he follows that term up with the, a term referring to more or less the active partners in man-male intercourse. And the term there that he uses in the Greek is arsenokoitai. This is a term that's formed from the Levitical prohibitions of man-male intercourse in Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013. What he's doing is taking the Greek translation of the Old Testament text, and he's taking the word for male, which is arson, and he's taking the Greek word for lying in the sense of having sexual intercourse with, which is koite, and he's putting them together, and he's got a masculine suffix on it, and when you translate the term literally, arseno koitai, it means men lying with a male. What's interesting about this term, we very clearly know it's formed from the Levitical prohibitions, not only because it uses two Greek words that are drawn from those prohibitions, but also because the term does not appear in Greek, in, in Greek literature um, until the sixth century or so AD, long after its first usages in Jewish and Christian circles. And it, as a deliberate construction of Jews and Christians, it's a way of saying that our indictment of man-male intercourse is every bit as absolute, involving all forms of this practice, as is the prohibition in Leviticus 18 and 20. We also know this to be the case from the larger background, because we, again, we have in rabbinic material, we have a parallel Hebrew expression that's used, mishkav sekur, which, me, which is the abst related abstract noun in Hebrew, meaning lying with a male. In the Babylonian Talmud, the question is raised, who is the male with whom the man is lying with? Does this refer only to an adolescent, or does it also involve an adult man? And their answer, both adolescents and adult men. So they're talking both about pederastic forms of man-male intercourse between a man and an adolescent male, but also adult, consensual, committed unions between men as well. And they use this term, mishkaf sekur from the Hebrew of the Levitical prohibitions. Also in the larger context in Leviticus 6, Paul later cites a part of Genesis 2.24, the two shall become one flesh. When he's talking about a less significant issue where he's stressing gender differences between a man and woman and referring to texts from Genesis 1 and 2 in 1 Corinthians 11, he's citing Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 in those contexts, 
both Genesis 1.27 and 2.24, the same text, incidentally, that Jesus cites as normative for all matters of sexual ethics. Paul cites them in, in 1 Corinthians 11 and also cites Genesis 2.24 in this context in 1 Corinthians 6 as a way of saying what's wrong with the asinokoitai, the men who lie with a male. Which, well, what's wrong about it is it doesn't conform to the pattern of sexuality that's put forth in Genesis 2.24, that a man lies with a woman, and only a man and a woman become one flesh. And then we can look at other ways in which this term asinokoitai is used in the ancient, is used in texts um, elsewhere in early Christian circles, and it consistently refers exclusively to homosexual practice between men. The further commentary on what Paul means by that is made clear in Romans 1, where Paul talks about man, a male and a male, and a female with a female, which is an absolute way of expressing all forms of homosexual practice. So there really isn't any doubt that what Paul is doing there is indicting all forms of man-male intercourse, whether consensual and committed or not. And he's saying that such people will not inherit the kingdom of God. When Paul refers to the list of offenders in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, he's not merely talking about isolated acts. He's talking about persons who engage in the behavior consistently, without repentance, without any desire to turn away from the behavior, and therefore their whole persons can be tagged as sexually immoral people or adulterers or men lying with a male or a series of other offenses that follow. Paul is talking about people whose being is defined by this behavior because they commit it repetitively and unrepentantly. We see lots of grace in the New Testament from Jesus and Paul, but neither of them promote the view that a person can be engaged in egregious sin that dishonors the person that God has made and that which God finds abhorrent and expect to inherit the kingdom of God. This is why the Sermon on the Mount closes with a triplicate of warnings. Broad is the path that leads to destruction, narrow is the gate that goes into life, few enter into it. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and I will say, I never knew you because you didn't bear the fruit consistent with that confession. What will it be like for those who merely hear my words and do not do them. It will be like those who build their house on sand, and when the great storm comes, complete destruction occurs. Jesus makes these warnings to say, grace does not entitle us to live a life of enslavement to sin and disobedience to God. On the contrary, grace empowers us to no longer live a self-dishonoring, self-degrading life and to rather live a life in obedience to the one whom we confess as Lord. Paul makes the same point repeatedly in his letters. We know from 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians, and other texts, Galatians, that Paul consistently, when he gave teaching to his converts, after he dealt with the initial issue of idolatry and the necessity of turning away from any other gods, to serve the one true and living God of Jesus Christ. The very next issue that he dealt with with his Gentile converts was sexual immorality. He repeatedly made the argument to them that if they were to continue to live as they did as Gentiles before they knew Christ in egregious sexual immorality, they would not inherit the kingdom of God that the gospel proclaims. What Paul makes clear is that only those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. He says this in Romans 8, 14, or in Galatians 5, he says, only those who are led by the Spirit of God are not under the law's jurisdiction. If a person is still primarily living out of the sinful impulse operating in the human members, if that's who their Lord is in their regular behavior, then sin will recompense them with death. They are living as if Jesus Christ never made a difference in their life. They may mouth a few words of confession, but they live the same kind of life that they lived before they knew Jesus. That's living in the realm of Adam, in the realm of Adamic flesh, 
and everybody who lives in that realm is under the law. And everybody who is under the law will be condemned because they cannot keep the law. They are not empowered by the law to keep the law's commandments and the law will hold them culpable and it will issue in death. The only persons that are liberated from that law are persons who live in the controlling influence of Christ's spirit. That would, that's what it means to be in Christ. So that when Paul says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, he means exactly what he lays out in the next 13 verses. Those who are in Christ are those who live in conformity to the spirit of Christ operating in their human members. Those are the persons who live out of the new creation. The law of Moses has no jurisdiction over the new creation. Those who live, however, as if they are still bound by the old creation because they live in conformity to sin in the flesh will be under that law and will perish. That's what the gospel states for Paul. It's what the gospel states in Jesus' message, and we would do well to heed it. Oh,